Have you ever heard the term in the deep end? Diving into the deep end. You know? Isaiah. Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, Brother Guy, when we started doing the Wednesday night Bible study without the canned stuff, we, we kind of went into the deep end of the pool. You know, it was like, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, nothing like just jumping right in with both feet. <laughs> With no floaties, yeah. yeah, and no lifeguard, right? No, we had lifeguard. Yeah, the Lord was with us. That's right. But you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there there's an idea of also the shallow end, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, for a lot of people, that they're happy in the shallow end. You know, we were a little nervous jumping into the deep end, weren't we? You know, because of the unknowns. You know, I mean, theology, uh, prophecy. I mean, stuff like that. I mean, for a lot of people, they don't want to dive into that stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's also an idea, though, of, of shallowness. You know, um, and, and we see examples of that in the Bible, of what happens when, when we don't have the, that, that deepness. You know, the, uh, the concept maybe of the farmer, you know, deep-rooted, you know, trees that have deep roots, you know, or by a water source, they flourish. But what happens when you find a tree that's got very shallow roots? Mm -hmm. It was interesting. We went through a hurricane, Hurricane Hugo, and there was two trees out in front of our house. Uh, one of them was a big old sugar pine. And if you've never experienced a sugar pine, I mean, you can cut one of those things down, and within seconds there's a layer of sap on the, on the stump that's just, it's amazing how much moisture is in those things. Mm -hmm. And they're notorious for being shallow-rooted. And then there's, we had an oak tree. You know, the oak, good sturdy oak, right? Guess which one came through the house? Yeah, the oak tree. The oak tree. Yeah, the sugar pine, it just it stood the test. I mean, it, it went through the hurricane, no problem. But, you know, when you're shallow rooted, you know, or where you're not, you don't have that depth to you, then, then easily things can happen to you. You know, that tree, easily it was blown down. It didn't have that taproot. And we, we've seen examples of that throughout the, the, the Bible of what happens when you don't have that depth. So we're kind of going to look at a little bit of uh, this idea uh, of shallowness. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 24. And as you're turning there, basically to set the stage for this, uh, this is in the ninth year, in the tenth month, of the tenth day, okay, of their captivity. Uh, so we have a time frame that we're looking at. But we're going to look at Ezekiel and his life here a little bit. We'll start out at verse 15. And it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly, do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourning. So I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? So I said to them, The word of the Lord came to me. Say to the house of Israel, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to des desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be a sign to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. And you, Son of Man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, 
On that day, a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time, your mouth will be opened. You will speak with him and will no longer be silent. So you will be assigned to them and they will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel, a prophet. And, and here, uh, some very difficult things for him. You know, the Lord basically is telling him that you're going to lose your wife. She's going to die. And you're not to mourn for her. But the, the Lord is showing Ezekiel how he feels towards Jerusalem and towards his people. Mm -hmm. And he says basically, don't, don't mourn for her because I'm not going to mourn for Jerusalem. Because they've gone away from his heart. It says there in verse 21, I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. See, their heart was in the building or in the city. You know, all their, their joy was in Jerusalem itself and not in the Lord himself, the one that they were supposed to take pride in and delight in. See, the Lord delighted in Jerusalem because that's the city for his holy people. His affection was there for his people, and yet their affection wasn't with him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. They weren't doing that. They were loving the system, weren't they? The religious things. You know, the, the Temple of Solomon. You know, we can just barely grasp maybe what, the, what that temple actually looked like, the splendor of it, the gold and, the, and, the, and the, how ornamented it was, you know. And here he's basically saying when this, this, this person arrives, that, that is going to be a signal to you that that's been destroyed. I mean, for the people, you know, and, and it goes in verse 25, and you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their heart's desire, and their sons and, and daughters as well. Their, their affection and their loyalty was in the wrong places. You know, their stronghold should have been God. But with the nation of Israel, it was always about the, the, the might that they had because of God's protection. They didn't acknowledge that. They'd gotten so accustomed to, to winning. They'd gotten so accustomed to being in God's blessing that they never considered the fact that it was God himself was the one that was blessing. So he's basically saying, I'm going to hold them accountable for that very fact that their, their, their joy is in the wrong place, their love is in the wrong place, their, 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 their faith is in the wrong place. But this was... As I said, if you want to find it, it's in the first verse of 24. It's in the ninth year of the tenth month on the tenth day. Now, if you would, turn with me to chapter 33 of Ezekiel. We'll look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, In the twelfth year, of our exile in the tenth month on the first day a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said the city has fallen it took three years for this prophecy to be fulfilled three years that Ezekiel was basically silent prophetically he wasn't allowed to speak things prophetically you know he was still allowed to speak but he was silent you know, there's been times, you know, at the end of the Old Testament, it was called the silent years there because nobody had heard from God for quite some time. You know, sometimes I look around and think, is that what we're going through in the, in the world around us right now is, is a silent period while we're waiting on God's prophecies to come true? Here in the book of Ezekiel, it was three years. God had proclaimed this was going to happen. And in that three years, do you think the people even cared? Probably not. They still prayed towards Jerusalem, towards the temple, because that's where their heart was. 
It wasn't with God. It was with their religion. It continues on there in verse 22. <coughs> it says, Now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer silent. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. But we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, since you eat meat with the blood still in it and look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? God's asking them a question. She, you know, they, they, they were practicing things that God had said that, that were detestable to him. To eat the, the meat the, that still had the blood in it. If you go back to Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, man is given an ordinance there. Or a covenant, excuse me. And in verse 1 of chapter 9 of Genesis, this is God talking to Noah after he got off the ark, after the flood. And it says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I, have, I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. The, the nation of Israel, the remnant of people that were left in Jerusalem, basically God saying, I'm, I'm still watching. You know, the, the temple had been destroyed. You know, the, and, and yet they were there, and they were, they were thinking they were something special. They, they, there was a, a remnant there. They're, they're looking back to Abraham. He was just one man, and God gave him the entire land. So we must, you know, since there's a lot of us here, we get the whole thing, right? That was their thought. God's going, no. You're doing things that are detestable in my sight, things that I commanded mankind not to do. They were eating the, the, the flesh of the animals with the blood still in it. You know, the life is in the blood. You know, God says when you, you know, when you were to take an animal, you're supposed to drain its blood onto the ground. You know, there's a picture of the life returning back to the earth. But they were, they were discarding God's commands. And also it says there that, and look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? Well, what did God say about idols to his, his people? Thou shalt have no graven image, or you know, not any idols before me, other gods. And, and not only that, but they were they were shedding blood to those idols. Mm -hmm. You remember the story of of, of uh, uh, Elijah when he was there on, on Mount Carmel, and and the the prophets of Baal, you know, they were dancing around the altar trying to get the 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 the, the, the sacrifice consumed by fire, mm -hmm. and so they started cutting themselves trying to wake up their god. You know, that was a practice there. And, and God's saying, you know what, you're doing these things that I find detestable. And yet you think you should possess the land? That's what got his people kicked out of the promised land. They weren't following or obeying God's commandments. You, verse 26, you rely on your sword, you do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? Say this to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, 
Those who are left in the ruins will fall by the sword. Those out in the country I will give to the wild animals to be devoured. And those in strongholds and caves will die of plague. I will make the land a desolate waste, and her proud strength will come to an end, and the mountains of Israel will become desolate so that no one will cross them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. When I have made the land a desolate waste, because of all the detestable things they have done. The Lord was paying attention, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. He's omniscient, omnipresent. He knows all. He's all powerful. He's, he's everywhere. And they were doing these things. And the, and the Lord's saying, I, I see what's going on. You're doing all these detestable things, and yet you think I'm just going to overlook it? Yeah, some of you were, were, were the remnant. But God had told the prophets before that that if that they refused to go into captivity, that they would die. And here he reaffirms it. They could either choose to go into captivity or to, to forfeit their life. He said there was a punishment to be had for the sins that had been committed. And here, I mean, they were doing all these things. All these detestable things in God's sight. And yet they didn't think anything of it. They didn't think, uh, you know, we don't deserve punishment. Let me ask you, are there detestable things going on in the world around us right now that match these things? Yeah. And yet the world around us right now is going, we're fine. God, God doesn't see us. He, he isn't going to, to punish us for these things. <laughs> Well, we know as Christians that the next big event on God's prophetic timeline is the rapture of the church and the, and the great tribulation. See, God is not turning a blind eye towards it. He's hoping and he is, is, is calling out to, to a lost world that they would just repent and turn from their wicked ways, just like he was calling to his nation before this to repent. Those three years that were, were there, God was giving them an opportunity to repent mm -hmm. before these things happened. Did they? No. Mm -hmm. Time and time again, his people basically said, ah, oh, God's not going to do anything. We'll just keep on doing things the way we've been doing it. We'll, we'll go through the motions. I mean, you, you, for the nation of Israel, you know, temple worship, well, that was important. But it was all about the temple, wasn't it? as we've seen here. Their, their hope was in the religion and not in the true and living God. In verse 30, it says, As for you, son of man, your countrymen are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, Come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do, and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. They hear your words, but they do not put them into action. We're told in James chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, that's been a problem for mankind throughout history. You know, we'll, we'll listen to God. You know, how many people, you know, well, I went to church and I listened to the message, but did you apply it? Did you apply God's word, what he says is right, what he says is good to your lives? So the world around us right now, right now knows what God says is evil. But they're saying, no, it's good. They're trying to distort God's word. You know, Here, they listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. How many people are sitting in churches across this world right now? Oh, well, they hear the word. They don't want to put it in practice because it might mean you have to change, that I have to change. I know every time I get into the Word and, and I'll come across something that says, you, you, you got to do better. It scrubs. It gets in there. It convicts. 
That's why people really sometimes they don't like to even listen to God's word. They may be, you know, they may be listening, but are they truly hearing? I mean, I, I remember, you know, as a kid, you know, we'd be in church and, and afterwards, you know, dad would say, oh, what was the message on? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we heard, but we weren't listening, you know. The Spirit says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the, the Spirit says to the church in Revelation. You know, are we here to hear from God? You know, the, the nation of Israel, when they drew near to the temple, it was to do their religion. It wasn't to have that fellowship with God, to, to spend time near God, to love on God. You know, that's something I think going into this new year, that would be a great resolution. I'm going to love God even more this year than I did last year. I'm going to draw near to him to hear from him. I'm going to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But for the nation of, here, or nation of Israel here, they, they had no deep affection for God. It was affection for the temple. It was affection for their religious system. It was an affection for the power. You know, for the, it says that they, you know, they, they had the horses and they had, you know, the, the, the sword. They thought they were going to be able to go out and whoop up on the enemy. But guess what? There was an enemy on the horizon there to take them into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar was coming. And they didn't think anything of it. God had appointed him to come and, and to, to take into captivity the nation. But their faith and their trust was in the things that they had always done mm -hmm. instead of the things that God said you should be doing, you, you will do. It says, with their mouth they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. You know, that doesn't speak to our, our leaders or our nation, does it? Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been amongst them. God is going to hold them accountable for the word. You know, the world that we live in, they don't realize that they're going to be held accountable for the word. The word that they've rejected. When they stand before God at the great white throne, they're going to be held accountable for what God has said. Mm -hmm. and, and the nation of Israel at this time was no different. They liked to have their ears tickled. They thought, well, yeah, we, have, we went to the synagogue today, and you know, we're God's people, we're doing good. I got another gold star on the, well, it wasn't a refrigerator back then, whatever they had. But people are no different today. The scary thing, though, is, is uh, well, let me read you another passage. This one's found in Matthew chapter 7, if you want to turn there. This is Jesus speaking to his people. This is Jesus speaking to us, too. Matthew chapter 7, we'll start out at verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. People will come, they will listen, and they think, well, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian all my life. My family's Christian. We're a Christian nation. Well, it doesn't stand as true as it used to anymore. And they think that God is going to honor that just because, well, I'm a Christian, right? I'm good. I'm going to go to heaven because I've lived a good life. I put money in the plate and, and all those things that we think that are racking up points for us. You know, the, you know, the shallowness that people have of understanding God's word. 
They think that just because they claim Christ, it means that they're going to go to heaven. We're told that we were been given one name, and then it's the name of Jesus to believe in. You know, not the fact that he came and was born, you know, and was found in a manger, but the, that he came and died on the cross for our sins. Mm -hmm. You know, the picture of the temple worship that was happening. You know, they could draw near to God because of their faith in what God was going to provide. You know, Abraham. You know, they, they, they claimed Abraham, but yet they didn't understand the message of Abraham. When he told them that, you know, when, when, when Isaac, his son, asked, you know, well, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And he says, God himself will provide the sacrifice. It was his son, Jesus Christ. But that shallowness of understanding. And that happens all across our, our world. That shallowness that people think that, that just because they go to church that they're good to go. That's their fire insurance. They're going to be the ones like the, his people that stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? We were Christians. And they'll hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Mm -hmm. One more concept if you would, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. So we've had a shallowness of no deep affection. We've had a, a shallowness of just sentimental hearing. Let's look at one more shallowness that is, is described to us here. This is the parable of the sower. And I won't read you the parable, but let's get into the explanation of, of this parable. We'll start out at verse 13. And it says, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? Guy and I were, and, and, and the, the Sunday school group was kind of joking about that a little bit, you know, parables. You know, for, for the nation of Israel, well, it's a fulfillment of the verse right above it. That they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they may turn and be forgiven. He gives us parables to bring the truth alongside of the story. Or the story alongside the truth. You know, here is the parable of the sower. And it was something that they would have understood. You know, you go out and you spread seed and then not all the seed grows, Right? You know, uh, some of it, you know, would get eaten. Some of it would sprout up. But here's the, what he says the definition is. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where this word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. See, it says there that there's some that, you know, they, they hear the word, but Satan comes and just takes it away instantly. You know, and, and that happens inside of churches and outside of churches. People hear what God says through his word, but yet instantly they're like, that, you know, that was for 2,000 years ago. That, that, that doesn't apply to us today. We're more enlightened, aren't we? They have some reason why they don't believe the Bible. But then others, they said, as soon as, or uh, others like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. See, they've heard it, and they receive it. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The idea is that shallowness of root. That, you know, they haven't rooted themselves in the Lord. They haven't built upon the foundation that was given to us to build upon, and that's Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, they hear it. Yeah, oh yeah, I receive it. But yet, they don't want to dig in. Mm -hmm. You know, Bible study. For a lot of people, it's like, oh, that sounds boring. Well, 
how else do you grow unless you eat? You, you feast upon the word of God and on his promises. And that has happened to so many people across this world. Yeah, they may come and they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, yet they have no root. And then when bad times come, they, well, I guess maybe I wasn't saved. Or they, they, they you know, that, that church is full of hypocrites. Or whatever the case may be, they find some reason to, to go away. And it says they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. See, for you and I, as Christians, as believers, this is the part where we have to be careful. The worries of this world. Are there any worries that we might have today going on? You know, you see the news, you see what's going on, you know, wars and rumors of wars and famines and droughts and, and floods and hurricanes and what was that? Earthquakes. Earthquakes, <laughs> volcanoes. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these things. And, and yeah, we may be rooted in the word of God, but all these things come in and choke us out <clears throat> and steal away that which we've been given. So what can we do? Well, first of all, God says in his word not to worry. You know, God says it. You know, the old bumper sticker said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. There's a problem there. If God says it, that settles it. Our, our chore is to believe it. And how are we going to believe unless we read, unless we feast upon the word of God? We have to dig in. And then also, we need to do some weeding. We have to be careful of what we listen to and what we consume. You know, sometimes listening to some of the commentaries and other pastors and teachings out there, you'll come across something that you go, that ain't right. And you need to get away from those teachings. If it doesn't agree with the word of God, then that's a tear being sown into your life. You know, we need to be careful what we do what we listen to, what we consume. Others, verse 20 says, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. See, I think the challenge is, is do you believe God? Do you accept his word? Sometimes we don't understand it. I can guarantee you that's one of those things that, Lord, I don't understand what this means. Pray those kind of prayers. God is faithful to answer. You know, I, I've prayed that a couple of times, you know, that I can recall. You know, Lord, I don't understand what this means here. And there, there, literally there was one time I was sitting there and I don't understand this and I flipped a few pages and the, the answer was right there. I've read that passage hundreds and hundreds of times, but now the light came on and it's like, I understand it now, Lord, thank you. The Lord provided. But the idea is, that, you know, we need to be, you know, we need to have our soil tilled and ready for that seed and accept it. You know, that word that was planted inside of us, do we believe what God has said? See, that's the struggle, I think, that's going on in the church today. People really don't believe God's word. They want some other teaching or they want some other religious thing, just like the nation of Israel. Their faith is in something other than God and in his son, Jesus Christ. It's in the building. Well, why do you go there? Because it's the fanciest building. And if it's the fanciest building, they must be the closest to God, right? You know, because look at all that shiny stuff. The nation of Israel hadn't realized that the glory of God had departed from the temple. It wasn't about the building. Mm -hmm. Their faith and their, and, and, and their pride was in the structure or in the religion. Or anything. For us, it needs to be in that word that was planted inside of us. The truth of God. And believe in him. So we need to put down good roots, don't we? To sink the roots deep into that which we've been given to grow, 
like I said, you know, this being the first day of a new year, I think a good resolution is that I'm going to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to feed on his word. <coughs> I'm going to obey the things that he has taught us to obey. You know, I'm not saying to become legalistic. I'm saying I'm going to walk in fellowship with God this year. Pray. Ask. Seek. Knock. All those things that we've been told we need to do. Because I don't know about you, but, I, you know, th those words that he is going to tell a lot of religious people, depart from me, I never knew you. That should, I don't want to say scare us, but that should definitely motivate us to know God. You know, to, to invite, you know we, we said that, you know, as Christians, we invited him into our hearts. Well, he knows us then. Lord, here I am. You dwell inside of me. That's what we looked at in 1 Corinthians. As Christians, he dwells in us and we in him. That's the church. You know, we don't have to fear hearing, I never knew you. But are we going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? I think those are good things to resolve in this new year. I, I'm going to walk closer with God than I did last year. And the year after that, and the year after that, it's all about growing. The nation of Israel, at that time, you know, in, in Ezekiel, they weren't growing. They were already dead, basically. They were dead in the religion. They didn't love God. They, they loved the prominence. They loved the power. They, they love being the envy of the world, and they wanted that again, and they still do. But we as believers, we need to be about our Lord's work, doing the things that he's commanded us to do. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And then also to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's a lot of work for me right there. Just to, to love God with everything I have. Because every day I can look at myself and go, you know what? I didn't do so good in this area. I got room to improve. So mm -hmm. I hope, God willing, that we'll, we'll continue to examine this idea of shallowness. You know, what kind of a relationship do we have with our Lord? Is it superficial? Is it shallow? Have we... Have we tiptoed into the shallow end of the pool or have we dived into the deep end? You know, I, I hope that we're willing to dive into the deep end and say, God, I believe you because you've said it's true and these are your promises to me. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I thank you for your promises and Lord, for your desire that we love you and to walk with you, Lord. Help us to always put our faith and our trust in you, not in our religion, and not in, a, in the things that this world puts importance in, whether it be armies or, or, or political power or, or those things that have been promised through, through the world, Lord, but that our faith and our trust would be only in you. And Lord, I pray that in this coming year, you will help each and every one of us to walk in a deeper relationship with you and into a, a closer fellowship, Lord, and help us to just to shine as your people. Lord, that, that we would be able to honor you and glorify your name in all that we do. Lord, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you'll continue to open your word to us and teach us. Pour out your spirit upon us, we pray in Jesus' name.